The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Michigan wants to shut it down, but Ontario doesn't. And next month, it's widely expected that Canada will raise it when U.S. President Joe Biden visits Ottawa. Tonight, what to do about the Line 5 pipeline and the Great Lakes. Then we'll check in on an Ontario program that aims to better support black students by matching them with mentors called graduation coaches. It's Tuesday, February 21st, and that's next on The Agenda. Enbridge's Line 5 pipeline carries Western Canadian petroleum to Ontario and Quebec. It's almost 70 years old and runs more than 1,000 kilometres, including a stretch that passes underneath the Straits of Mackinac between Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. The state of Michigan, several Indigenous communities and many advocates concerned about what a rupture would do to the Great Lakes want it shut down. Its fate is once again before the courts. Let's hear from both sides. Joining us now in Calgary, Alberta, Heather Exner Piro, Senior Fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute. In Traverse City, Michigan, Liz Kirkwood, Environmental Attorney and Executive Director of the Nonprofit Conservation Group for Love of Water, also known as FLOW. In Kingston, Ontario, Warren Maybe, Canada Research Chair in Renewable Energy Development and Implementation at Queen's University. And here in our studio, Michelle Woodhouse, Water Program Manager at Environmental Defense and a Métis Water Protector. Thank you, Michelle, for joining us in studio and for those joining us on the line. So let's situate our conversation first with a map. Let's look at a map of Enbridge's Line 5. The pipeline starts at the city of Superior in Wisconsin, then moves east, crossing into Michigan. There it travels across under the environmentally sensitive Straits of Mackinac, which are waterways that connect Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. Then Line 5 stretches south and east to the southern tip of Lake Huron, ending in Sarnia, Ontario. Heather, I'm going to come to you first. What role does Line 5 play in Canada and the U.S.'s economy, energy economy today? Great. Well, thanks for the question. It, it has about, you know, over half a million um, barrels of, a day of, of uh, petroleum. It turns into gasoline, jet fuel, propane, uh, other petroleum products. Um, half a million is very significant, and it obviously feeds uh, a large swath of Ontario, Quebec, <clears throat> feeds most of uh, Pearson Airport, and also has uh, you know uh, impacts across uh, the northeast of uh, Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin, um, and elsewhere. So it is a very important pipeline. It delivers a, a large amount of, of petroleum uh, and has you know tens of billions of dollars uh, uh, you know of of, of impact and, and an economic uh, kind of. Uh, uh, situation there. Michelle, given the importance of Line 5 and keeping supply chains robust, energy, the cost of fuel manageable, teams, the homes heated and other functions, can communities thrive without it? Yes, absolutely. One of the first questions when I came into doing this work was how are we going to meet our energy needs without Line 5? Because I wanted to make sure that if I was going to be advocating for shutting down this pipeline in order to protect the Great Lakes, that we wouldn't be leaving Canadians in the dark or in the cold. So I had a report that was commissioned out to an industry expert who has decades of experience working on relevant um, analysis related to the scope of the report that I had done. And that report found that yes, in fact, we can meet our crude oil energy needs today without line five. All right, Warren, I'm going to come to you. Um, let's talk about sort of the widespread implications if line five ceases operations. Let's short term and long term. So short term, uh, the refineries in Sarnia that do provide a lot of those refined products, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, uh, that refinery would be starved. Uh, they would have to scramble in the very short term to find uh, another source. There is quite a bit of discussion about how other pipes could be used to feed those refineries and to feed that demand. Um, and I, I do agree that there probably are ways that it could be done. Whether or not it could be put into play in the short term, how long it would take to get those new supply lines in place, um, I think is a question. Immediately you would see a price impact uh, because there would be a supply constraint uh, and that would uh, impact consumers in Ontario and Quebec. It would impact consumers 
um, on uh, the Great Lakes states as well. In the longer term, I do think that, yes, we could find some of these alternatives. There are uh, potentially other uh, pipeline pathways. There are potentially other ways to move uh, crude around, uh, but it would have a lot of uh, disruption in the short term. Liz, what risks does Line 5 pose to the safety of the Great Lakes? Well, thank you. Um, this conversation really needs a little more context of the the fact that this is a 70 year old pipeline that's located in the open waters of the Straits of Mackinac, which is one of the worst possible places for a catastrophic oil spill, according to the University of Michigan. Um, it has far uh, reaching implications for both Canada and the US. It could potentially uh, uh, destroy uh, drinking water supplies and impact over 700 miles of, um, of private and public properties, both in Canada and the US. Um, this is the wrong pipeline in the wrong location. The, the Great Lakes, of course, represent some 20% of the planet's fresh surface water. Um, over 25% of Canadians receive their water from the Great Lakes. Um, and the, um, the water, the significance of the Great Lakes cannot be underestimated. I also just want to mention that the location of these pipelines is um, in is in a high density shipping location and multiple anchors have struck and hit the pipeline over the past couple of years. And there are other incidences that we may not even be aware of, but make no mistake, if if the an anchor uh, struck and, and burst these pipelines, um, the magnitude of the harm would be extraordinary. And the best case scenario of, you know, a 30% cleanup um, would would just destroy um, this extraordinary shared resource that both Canadians, uh, uh, the, the US and multiple sovereign nations share in their stewardship duties. Liz, Michigan's uh, governor, Gretchen Whitmore, has ordered Enbridge to cease operations in the dual lines in the Straits, calling it an unreasonable risk. Uh, Enbridge has, of course, rejected that order. And in response, Michigan has sued Enbridge and is now in that case is now currently before a U.S. federal court. Of course, we know permits, environmental assessments for this project could take years to complete, uh, and they're still pending. Do you think Enbridge will continue, and I, I understand it is still operating, but will it continue to operate the line until a court decision is reached? Well, from what we have seen is that Enbridge continues to defy the, uh, the revocation and termination of the easement. This is a public trust easement. It is permission from the state of Michigan to occupy publicly owned bottom lands. Um, and they have, have, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, clear defiance. And similarly, uh, in the Bad River Band case, which is in Wisconsin, um, and that territory is in the in Wisconsin, uh, Enbridge is also invite. It has trespassed, and um, and the the court there has found Enbridge to be in violation of trespass. They are currently uh, looking at damages and injunctive relief. I, I want to just comment on the public um, the 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 public facing comments from Enbridge have created an image that. The, the sky will fall um, if if line shuts down. Huh. That is not the case. In fact, Ambridge's own experts in the Bad River Band litigation have made it abundantly clear that there are multiple supplies uh, in the region, including Ambridge's own Line 78 pipeline, which was rebuilt after the catastrophic 2010 Kalamazoo disaster that Enbridge caused here in Michigan, and um, that 
a line five shutdown will have minimal impact on businesses and consumers, specifically in the US, the, um, and, and this again is from Enbridge's own experts that the, the cost of the pump would be half a cent, uh, half to one cent. In Ontario, it could be, you know, four to six cents. And the question is, you know, we're not only talking about energy security, we're talking about water security, mm -hmm. right? The, we cannot, we cannot um, avoid discussing the extraordinary economic impact uh, and engine that the Great Lakes serves. The Great Lakes is the third largest economy in the world. And to put this at risk is, is unacceptable. All right. Well, Heather, I want you to pick up on some of that. Uh, Line 5, of course, splits into dual sections that run under the Straits of Mackinac. Line 5 has spilled more than 1.1 million gallons in at least 29 separate spills along its length. But it hasn't spilled in those dual sections that run under the Straits. Of course, um, Liz had mentioned some of those those the damages from from anchors. Uh, one of those being in 2018 when an anchor from a shipping freighter struck and damaged uh, the pipe. But there was no leak, to my knowledge, from that. I'm, I'm curious to get your take, Heather. There, do you think there's a real threat of that happening? So I think we need to put this into context. You know that we're producing 12, 13, uh, you know, million barrels a day. Uh, you know, in the United States, five billion in Canada. We have 840,000 kilometers of pipeline in Canada, and we don't have catastrophic spills every day. In fact, we have very few. I'm not sure why Line Five is is you know coming under attack or particular scrutiny. Um, you know, to put your number into context, that's one and a half Olympic-sized swimming pools. You know, since the 1960s. In the last 15 years, it's been 21 barrels. 21 barrels total. And remember, it's shipping, you know, upwards of, you know, over 500,000 barrels a day. And in 15 years, there's been 21 barrels spilled from that pipeline. Not a single incident in the Straits of Mackinac. So, of course, we all want fresh, fresh water, water security. No one wants to see the Great Lakes polluted. The alternatives are, are rail transport and truck transport. Those are not safer alternatives. Um, so... We cannot live without oil and gas. If we, we want to transition. It will take decades. We should work towards that. But in the meantime, our economies and our, you know, our economic security, as the government of Canada's position states, this is a matter of our energy security and our economic prosperity. And so why Line 5 is coming under for particular scrutiny, I'm not sure. We all have pipelines you know, crossing all of our watersheds, all of our waterways, and most of us just don't think about it because it's very safe. Michelle, uh, nodding your head. Uh, in disagreement. Uh, let me get your take on that. So I need to really clear up a few things. We can meet our crude oil demands today without Line 5, as has already been said. The report that I looked at, that I had commissioned, used Enbridge's own data, publicly available data, submitted to the Canadian Energy Regulator. And we looked at the total deliveries to Sarnia that then get carried onwards eastwards to the Montreal, to the Valero refinery. We accounted for the deliveries that get dropped off in the U.S. part, like U.S. region that Line 5 serves. And we found that actually neither Line 5 nor Line 78 are operating at capacity. It, the numbers are roughly around 644,000 barrels a day that get delivered to Sarnia, Ontario. And between Line 78 and Line 5, that are the two main pipelines that serve crude oil to this region, there's over 1 million barrels of capacity. People cite the 540,000 540, barrels a day number, that that's Line 5's capacity. That is not what it carries. So we know that we can make up the majority of the shortfall with another pipeline that is newer. And we also know that the remaining shortfall can be made up by either one to two rail trains on additional trains a day on routes already moving crude oil or one or less marine tankers on routes, routes already moving crude oil. We know that we won't be left without jet fuel. We will be able to serve our energy needs. Refineries won't go out of business because of the fact that the necessary product 
is making it to market. We also accounted for the 80, roughly 80,000 barrels, or sorry, 80,000, uh, yes, barrels a day of natural gas liquids that move through the pipeline. There's also ample sources for that product to make it to market. So we know that we can shut down this pipeline. It can happen um, faster than a tunnel would get built, faster than a reroute would get built, which are both dangerous plans in their own right. This can happen within two years or less. We can have a plan that we do this and we can have things be smooth and, and we can do this without having already a huge electric ve uh, fleet of vehicles on the road. We can do it without having already the total electrification of the grid. We can do it with the mix of crude and renewables that we currently use to meet our energy needs. And that is um, what we need people to understand is that yes, we have energy needs to meet here in Ontario and Quebec. That's, and we, we've been saying for decades, we've been trying to get progressive policies put in place and fossil fuel corporations like Enbridge have been lobbying to have regressive policies put in place. And it's really frustrating when we get told we can't do this overnight. We know that. And we've been, being, we've been seeing delays happen for decades. You know, we know there's information out there that fossil fuel corporations have hidden from the public that they knew for decades the harms being caused to the climate. So I don't like when I hear these arguments to folks like myself that we can't do this overnight because we're very aware of that. And I was being very reasonable and doing my homework when I made sure that I went and found out how we would meet our energy needs without this pipeline. And I also want to say one more thing. This pipeline pipeline is not just a threat in the Straits of Mackinac. That is one of the worst places in the world for a pipeline to be. And today, this pipeline would never get the OK to go through there. It is also a huge threat to Lake Superior from Bad River, which is actually the proper name is Medicine River and Anishinaabe Moen. So and in the Straits of Mackinac, in a best case scenario, Ambridge would have 13 and a half minutes to shut off the pumping valves there. And in that time frame, over 1 million litres of crude oil, some of the dirtiest tar sands oil in the world, the heaviest, hardest to clean up, over 1 million litres in 13 and a half minutes could gush out into the Straits of Mackinac, or sorry, into the Great Lakes and engulf up to uh, 1,200 kilometres of shoreline and destroy, press it, uh, uh, damage precious places like Tobermory, Manitoulin Island, Sauble Beach on the Canadian side. That's only on the Canadian side and it would have implications downstream as well. So we are gambling with 84% of North America's fresh water. This pipeline is in the heart of the Great Lakes. It's in the, which is like, you know, this is, we cannot mess with a source of drinking water for over 40 million residents. We cannot gamble with that. And when we think about who are the people that are talking about whether this pipeline is safe or not, we have Enbridge, who has a known track record of pipeline spills. And we know that Enbridge is the uh, corporation that owns the world's largest fossil fuel pipeline network in the world. So their interests are to keep that going. Then you have indigenous nations, such as the Anishinaabe, who have been for over 10,000 years at least the original stewards and inhabitants of these lands and waters and these people as well as folks like myself who I'm a dedicated water protector are doing our homework to find out how we protect this really important precious the world's largest freshwater system we're talking about and when we look at who is talking about whether this pipeline is safe or not, you need to look at the backgrounds of the people and what their motivations and interests are. People like the Anishinaabe Nation and myself are motivated by protecting the Great Lakes for seven generations to come. Ambridge is motivated by the longevity of the fossil fuel, corporate, uh, fossil fuel industry and the tar sands. So people need to think about this. I want to get in a statement from Enbridge. Of course, they are not here uh, to defend. Uh, and so I want to make sure I get a statement in from them. So due to time constraints, Enbridge's Chief Communications Officer, Mike Fernandez, wasn't able to join us for today's panel. But Enbridge did send us a statement about safety measures and the or that the organization has taken to prevent oil spills into the Great Lakes. It reads, Incident prevention is our highest priority. Line 5 is monitored 24-7 by a dedicated team who take immediate action to cease flow within the line via automated remote shutoff procedures should they detect a change in pressure, flow, or other operational anomalies. We have trained personnel and dedicated resources that allow us to respond quickly to a release in the Straits of Mackinac. Enbridge has also implemented state-of-the-art measures that enhance safety and reduce the risk of an anchor strike by 99.5%. They include high-definition cameras positioned through the strait to check anchors on large vessels are stowed. Warren, I'm going to get you in on here. Are the measures Enbridge has taken and what um, Michelle has brought up um, 
is this going to be able to prevent oil spills in the Great Lakes adequately? I don't think it can prevent oil spills per se. It can minimize the impact of oil spills. Uh, Ambridge has a history, and, and a lot of people are aware of that history. Uh, they've had some fairly damaging spills, including the Kalamazoo River um, a decade or so back. Uh, there are a lot of people who are very concerned about what might happen should those automatic procedures not kick in as quickly as they could, uh, or should somebody miss something, you know, some important piece of data. So, you know, I think that people are right to be concerned. This is a risky point in the line. Uh, there are multiple risky points in this line. Uh, but people also need to think about uh, how to make a transition. So if, if we don't want line five to operate, how might we transition? Uh, I do agree that some of that capacity can be picked up by, by existing pipes that are further south, but not necessarily all. Uh, there would be impacts on prices there is work that would need to be done to, to prepare people and to prepare the markets for that. Um, I'm not saying it shouldn't be done, but I'm not saying it can be done without an impact because there would absolutely be impacts. I want to I want to stick with you and ask you sort of a little bit more about the the tunnel project itself. Enbridge yeah. plans to build a tunnel deep under the strait into the into the lake bed to house a new segment of Line Five. Essentially, it would be a, a large tunnel, and then the pipe would be inside that. Some have some pipeline safety experts say that transporting oil and gas through an enclosed tunnel could lead to an explosion. Um, some have called it a ticking time bomb in, in, in that regard as well. How plausible is that? So if there was uh, in anywhere, uh, anywhere along that tunnel a leak, um, you know, if there were gases or liquids that were escaping and, and pooling, if there was an, an ignition source uh, that could light that, yes, there could be a very big problem with the tunnel. However, Again, these are not things that are just sort of thrown together. There would be uh, fairly extensive safety measures built into any tunnel system that was put in place. I assume 24 hour monitoring. Um, I'm less concerned about uh, the risk of a catastrophic explosion. I'm actually more concerned about you know the cost. At, at some point, Enbridge has to think about, does it make sense to put all of this infrastructure in place uh, to keep this older pipeline system working? Would it make sense to utilize other pipes within their system? Uh, that's a dialogue that I think we need to have. I think that there needs to be discussion about what would be the smartest next step for the company. Can I say a couple of things really quick? Mm -hmm. Just on the price Actually, impacts. Can I, can I say something? Oh. How, about we'll get, how about we'll do Liz and then we'll get Michelle. Sure, right? yeah. So with respect to the tunnel, it, this this is a, a a false option for for the public to really engage in because um, right now the the most important issue is getting line five out of the Straits of Mackinac. I don't I don't know if the public understands this, but these pipelines are in the open waters, moving with these extremely powerful currents. For the past twenty years, the the, the um, you know, this has been the Achilles heel of this pipeline. Enbridge has been trying to, has has placed over 200 uh, braces that they call anchors on the lake bed floor to, to hold this down. And they, the, um, you know, if an anchor struck and yanked this, I mean, it, it would, it would be absolutely catastrophic. Uh, Enbridge, uh, you know, it, it has posited this, this, solution when it is clear that there is existing capacity throughout the Great Lakes pipeline system. Um, the, the new report from the International um, Energy Agency, the IEA, says that there can be, in, in their net zero by 2050, there can be no new fossil fuel infrastructure if we're actually going to achieve the climate goals that our nations and this planet needs. Um, the the idea of an investment of you know half a billion is is not you know is a very low estimate that's you know a couple of years old. In addition, Enbridge is facing a reroute for 41 miles around the Bad River Band, 
why would we be investing in additional fossil fuel projects rather than looking to smart transitions? Things are happening at this extraordinary pace. The, the need for um, the same levels of propane for residential household is being reduced with heat pumps and other measures. And, the, and, and I just wanna emphasize how important it is for people to recognize that markets adjust. The, I mean, if you think about Canada, you've had the reversal of line nine, the uh, Cochin pipeline, we've had reverse lines of cap line. This system is in constant flux. If there's one thing that we know that uh, there, there's, you know, no, there is no one refinery that relies on one pipeline. That would not be a good system. And uh, everybody is on notice that this pipeline must be shut down. We know that, you know, the Toronto uh, Pearson Airport was even looking for alternative supplies and, you um, this this is a, a a an opportunity for our our nations to work collaboratively together to get this particularly dangerous and risky pipeline that threatens 20% of the planet's fresh surface water and we can do that but it requires uh smart innovative and orderly changes and collaboration all right, Michelle, very quickly, I'm gonna yeah. get you to respond. I was just, I was just yeah. gonna say, I really wanna clear, like the price impacts, we, our study showed, it would be roughly two cents per liter in Ontario and Quebec. Liz just did a really good summary of the issues with the reroute and the tunnel. And we know that together those things will cost well over a billion dollars. Now that's nothing for a company like Enbridge, but that is money that could be better used towards renewables. And we know that the oil demand globally, there's a lot of projections that show as early as the late 2020s and early 3030s, Canada needs to plan for a steep decline in global oil demand. So to build a reroute and a tunnel that will take at least six to ten years for each one to be completed makes no sense. Heather, I'm going to get your take as well on this. Yeah, it's nice that everyone's so concerned about Enbridge's bottom line. I guess that's the risk that Enbridge has to take. We don't need a public dialogue. If they lose money, that's not a loss to the to the taxpayer. And so I feel like Enbridge is probably best positioned to understand what the demand is for its product, whether the investments will pay off in, in the medium term or not. Um, it, you guys are correct that we will not reach net zero if we keep investing in fossil fuel infrastructure, but we will also not have energy security. And and I think we've seen, and the tone has changed since 2022 and, and the Russian war in Ukraine, that energy security is also important, that climate uh, security is very important, water security is important, but so is energy security. Uh, there's 85 million people in the Great Lakes region, and they all need petroleum products. Um, the economy needs it, society needs it, people in their heating home need it. So, so I think, you know, if, if Enbridge is wrong in its forecast of the demand, then that will be a cost that Enbridge has to bear. And I don't think is, it should be a top concern for, for the public. All right. I'm going to read uh, a, a little bit of a, a statement that we had received. Of course, Enbridge has also faced pushback from Indigenous communities situated on the shores of the Great Lakes on both sides of the border. We have a statement from the Anishinaabek Nation, which represents 39 First Nations communities in Ontario. Uh, it was sent to us by Grand Council Chief Reginald Niganobi on Friday, February 17th. The Anishinaabe Nation supports the shutdown of Line 5. Our communities have collectively stood in solidarity with our relations along the pipeline to protect the land and water against the potential for catastrophic environmental damage. For centuries, peoples of our nations have been caring and relying on the Great Lakes. We are reliant on the waters for our way of life. We will we will be relieved when this line is effectively decommissioned and we express our gratitude to our relatives who have been leading these critical advocacy efforts for years. Heather, I'm actually gonna come to you first. You've written about pipelines becoming the leading edge of economic reconciliation. I'm hoping you can sort of explain that. What are your thoughts on the tension between Enbridge and indigenous communities on line five? Yeah, so, so there are many different perspectives from many different indigenous communities. Uh, Enbridge, uh, obviously there's some tension on this one. I think everyone on this call would agree that they should reroute, uh, you know, uh, around the Bad River Band. Um, and so, and, and everyone supports that, and that's Canada's position too. However, 
there are many indigenous communities that do support, uh, you know, pipelines or have had economic development pipelines. Line three in Minnesota was a great example on both sides of the border. Oh. And just a few months ago, Enbridge actually um, sold 11.5% uh, stake of its Athabasca pipelines in northern Alberta to a group of 23 indigenous communities, Métis and First Nations from Treaty Areas 8 and Treaty Areas 6. And so Enbridge is doing a good job in some parts. Uh, not all indigenous communities are, are opposed to pipelines. Um, some are are welcoming the own source revenues and the jobs that that brings. Uh, and so, uh, you know, they need to find a way uh, to manage the relationship in this area. I would say, I would also add though that the Ontario and Anishinaabek are not directly affected by this pipeline. If there was a spill, if there was a catastrophic fill, uh, spill, they would be impacted, but so would all of us. No one wants to see that, least of all Enbridge. Um, but that pipeline does not run through their territory. So 12 federally recognized Anishinaabe tribes in the U.S. and 10 more in Ontario have passed resolutions calling for Line 5's closure. Michelle, I want you to get a comment on, on there on Heather as well, but you, you sort of touched on it. How might a Line 5 spill affect their livelihoods? Well, I mean, it absolutely, to say this doesn't affect, like, affect them and it's only a matter, a spill, this does affect them. Water does not care about political colonial borders. It moves past that. And so the fact that this poses an existential threat to the way of life for the Anishinaabek people is unacceptable. This is an ex existential threat to anyone who's in the area. It's an ecological disaster in the making. And just because the pipeline doesn't run through their territory doesn't mean that it doesn't impact them. And just so you are aware, the actual original traditional territories of the Anishinaabek Nation is across the entire Great Lakes. The colonial borders came afterwards, and they were all one nation, and they still are. All right, Warren, I'm going to come to you. Uh, you, you sort of, you, you've talked a little bit about sort of uh, solutions, viable solutions. What are some viable alternatives to Line 5? So the best alternative would be to find another pipeline uh, or combination of pipelines that could deliver the product that's required. Uh, I think that trains and, and marine shipments or, or seaway shipments uh, could be done in the short term, but it's not ideal. Uh, we know the risk uh, that goes with shipping oil by train. Uh, we know the risks uh, that go with shipping uh, by, by boat. We don't want another uh, Exxon Valdez on the Lake Superior shores. You know, we want to avoid that um, at all costs. So finding another pipeline system is the best way to meet these kind of short to midterm needs as we transition away from oil and gas. Yes, there is some capacity. Um, it's not enough to fully make up for what would be lost if, if Line 5 is taken offline. Uh, it would have economic impacts it would put more pressure on those pipes that run south of the Great Lakes uh, through other, you know, uh, traditional territories, through other watersheds and, and through other parts of the country. Um, it might be the right way to go. You know, uh, that is a decision that uh, people could advocate for. It's a decision that Enbridge can make. Uh, but right now, um, we don't have enough capacity to simply turn off Line 5 and not feel any impacts. There would definitely be impacts felt both sides of the border. Liz, I'm going to come to you. Canada's Minister for Natural Resources, Jonathan Wilkinson, says adding pumping stations or transporting the product via rail is less safe, less efficient, and higher emitting. Is that true? I, there's consensus about the, uh, the different modalities of transporting hazardous liquid pipelines has all sorts of levels of risk and pipelines are the, are the safest way to transport um, these. But that, but that is not the query that we're um, engaged in here. We, what we are looking to do is make a transition to make sure that this dangerous 70-year-old pipeline that's located in the open waters of the Great Lakes is decommissioned. And what we what, what will, will happen in this transition is a series of choices. Uh, and it will be a combination, as Enbridge's own experts have testified, that there are ample uh, the alternatives from existing pipelines, including Line 78, their own pipeline, they're, they're going to be choices 
Um, prior to 2015, the, the Quebec refineries were receiving waterborne shipments of oil. That could be part of the equation. There is going to be, as Michelle has mentioned, there, um, there would be some, some rail options. These are better options in the whole when you, and when you took look at the totality than the current status quo. And with the pending litigation, Enbridge is making you know over two million plus dollars a day, uh, just allowing and delaying the transition from happening. We again need to be focusing on the opportunity here, where we can collaborate and really make the adjustments in the system where we're focusing on net zero. All right, I only have about a minute left. Warren, you're gonna get the last cue here. One of the, the central tensions here is that both Canada and the US seemingly have strong environmental policies, yet there is a need to maintain energy security, especially given the global pressures. Of course, there is a war in the backdrop of this all. How do you think this will all play out? So the challenge that we've faced in Canada, and I think the challenge in the US, is that there is a definite need to transition, but no clear plan to make that transition. And, you know, hopefully this debate over line five and the challenges there can help us get into a conversation about what that transition looks like. It won't be painless. You know, I, I disagree with the comment that there's ample uh, pipeline capacity, because there's not. Uh, there's enough to take some of what's running through line five, but not enough to cover everything so that it's a perfectly seamless thing. What we need is to actually start implementing some of these plans for transition. And if that means closing line five as an example, we need to model that and to understand what those impacts look like. And we need to prepare for that as, a, as an economy and, and as a people. I don't disagree that that could be the right way to go. All right, Liz, Heather, Warren, Michelle, thank you so much for your expertise. Thank you so much for joining us on the program tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. First launched in 2020, Ontario's graduation coach program for black students has already helped more than 1,000 high schoolers across the province. With us now on how it's working in their area, from Windsor, Ontario, Sydney Moore, graduation coach in the Windsor-Essex Catholic District School Board, and Noemi, who is a high school student in the Windsor-Essex Catholic District School Board. Welcome. Hello. Good evening. I'm going to start with you, Sydney. Uh, not too long ago, you were walking the same hallways as the students you coach. Uh, what has it been like for you to perform this role? It's been amazing. It's definitely been inspiring uh, to hear and be a part of the visions of what the students want. Uh, as you know, the graduation coach program started in 2020. I began in October of 2021 with the goal of helping students achieve uh, their academic dreams and also to help when it comes to their well-being. Uh, this is issues embedded with mentorship where I'm a mentor to the students overall and I provide culture responsive support with addressing areas of need and focusing on leadership opportunities, transition activities when it comes to secondary to post-secondary transitions. Um, you know, focusing on engagement, social emotional well-being, academic success to help change climate. I'm curious if you can help break, uh, give us a little distinction here, because some people might say a graduation coach, hey, that sounds a little bit like a guidance counselor in, this, in, the, in the same regards of getting credits, uh, you know, having that face-to-face -face interaction with students. What, what are sort of the differences between the position you have and say a regular guidance counselor in a high school? Yeah, um, I, it's the idea that I, I work with our self-identified black students to help build trust within their community. Um, also, it wasn't that long ago, like you said, when I was walking the same pathway to and from school. By creating safe spaces for them within the schools and providing a platform where open door, where I'm opening doors, breaking barriers, and establishing pathways for them to succeed, uh, while building safe spaces for Black students, we're also creating a more inclusive and equitable environment for anyone that is marginalized within the educational system. All right. Noemi, I, I'm curious, what uh, motivated you to connect with Sydney in the first place? 
Um, so in the beginning of the school year, a variety of things happened where anti-black racism was occurring. And when the students in my school, we tried to like talk about it, get people involved, but the problem was that nobody was actually paying attention or listening. Um, so I was talking to another teacher and they said they would try to bring, the school's gonna bring in um, the guidance coaches, the graduation coaches. And um, I personally just wanted to go check and see if they were actually here to help us, what their goal was, and if they were here for the school or for the students. Later on, we found a way to work together through creating a focus group where we brought students in to amplify their voices to make sure that people were feeling heard and respected. Now looking at it, now that you sort of have a relationship with Sydney, um, do you find you're looking for mostly emotional and psychological support? Is it academic support? What type of support are you uh, seeking? I would say it's more like social, like um, social, um, when I say social and support, I mean like I just want support like through the process. I want advice. I want somebody like a nice face to look at. Like, you know, just making sure that I have somebody to encourage me and that is there for me to make sure that I feel comfortable doing what I'm doing. That's the kind of support I'd say that I'm looking for. All right. That she's provided me. Sydney, what, how does the emotional well being of, of Black, African, or Caribbean students uh, influence their educational outcomes? Um, there's a variety of things that it does. Um, academic support is very important, but also social emotional is important too. Uplifting their truths, their stories, and making sure that their experience, their lived experience is being amplified. Uh, you want to be an active listener in supporting them in their endeavors. And Noemi, you are now a student coordinator uh, at your school where you, you essentially work and listen with your peers and, and, and sort of understand sort of the, the, the troubles they might be having or the successes they may be achieving. What are some of the most common concerns or issues you hear from your black classmates when it comes to their academic success? That teachers do not respect them or take them seriously and that they feel like nobody wants to hear what they have to say. That is the main concern we're having as of right now is that nobody's taking us seriously and they don't care enough to actually pay attention to what we're trying to say. And so Sydney, you, you, hearing what uh, Noemi has to say regarding sort of what peers and, and, and sort of classmates are going through, how does that process work where you know a, a student may be feeling sort of these responses from from whether it's other classmates, administrators, or teachers, how do you then sort of work with them? I feel like every situation is different and individualistic, what the students are going through. Um, but through with the process of the focus group that we had uh, at Noemi School, we're able to listen to the experiences, what the students are feeling, amplifying their stories, and then, you know, working systematically to help to change and, you know, eliminate some of the barriers or gaps that they're experiencing. Um, the biggest thing is we want to build trust within the educational system and being able to support them on those endeavors are very important. All right, now let's talk about some barriers. I wanna look at some data. Uh, this is some data that outlines barriers that Ontario students face in high school and beyond. Between 2006 and 2011, 69% of black students graduated from high school in Toronto compared to 84% of white students. During the same period, 42% of black students were suspended at least once compared to 18% for white students. As well, just 53% of black students were enrolled in academic classes compared to 81% of white students and 80% of other racialized students. This research was conducted by the organization Pathways to Education and published in 2019. The data comes from seminal um, studies in Ontario's education system alongside statistics from the TDSB Toronto District School Board. Um, Sydney, I want to come to you first. One of, one of the things that's quite obvious is that data that we just put out there was from looking at 2006 to 2011, data from 12 years ago. I, I'm curious, do we need more race-based data uh, on educational outcomes? I definitely think so. Um, I think it's allowing us to actually see the symptoms of what is occurring systematically. Uh, I think data is very important and it will help, you know, uh, address some of the issues that are occurring. And, and let's, let's uh, have a look at that data in terms of the factors. What are some of the factors that contribute to the lower graduation rates of black students in Ontario? 
I think it's the barriers in itself. There are a variety of barriers, uh, barriers when it comes to fiscal barriers, systematic barriers, financial and economic barriers, uh, when it comes to race-based barriers as well. So anti-Black racism, racial biases, micro-macro aggressions, transitional barriers, pathway barriers, social, emotional, uh, environmental, it, it can be a combination of all of that and the intersectionality of all those barriers and gaps. With all the students that you work with, can you give us sort of an example, of course, uh, you know, not getting too personal uh, with their stories, but do you have an example of, of, of some sort of uh, concern or, or issue or barrier that a student has sort of approached you with and that you are sort of have worked on a solution towards? Yeah, one of the examples was uh, there was a student that was in the applied level stream. Uh, they were doing amazing work and they were getting 80s and 90s. Um, and we had a conversation. I asked the student, I said, why don't we see if you can go into the academic stream and see what you can do there? Because there, it would open a lot of pathways for you. So we worked together with guidance and we um, had the student go into the academic stream and now they're going to be going into university uh, in September. So, you know, addressing things and, you know, asking questions is very important. Noemi, have you or your peers on, on, on that conversation about streaming um, experienced racial discrimination in the academic streaming process? Yes. Um, when I was younger, like right before grade nine, um, most of my teachers were white and most of the students in my school were black, uh, African-American, Caribbean immigrants most of the time. So what would happen is a lot of the teachers wouldn't like try to teach us what streaming is. They wouldn't tell us a diff much about like what will happen if you don't take academic or if you take applied, um, the opportunities you can get. Most of the time they just tried to push us throughout what they thought we could do. They never actually asked us what we wanted and what we needed, they just, felt like they knew better than us and didn't really take the time to appreciate or listen to, to us, our feelings and what we had to say about school and what we want to do for our future. Because of that, it put a lot of people backwards and um, it put a stop for a lot of people. They couldn't, they didn't know what to do. They didn't have the help they needed because nobody told them this was gonna happen. And yeah, that's all I have to say about that. I'm curious, you know, before Sydney's position, was there anyone that you felt that was advocating for you, uh, making sure that, hey, you know, look out for something like this, you know, if, if, you don't, if you think you are, you know, maybe don't need to go into applied, that you can go into ac academic. Was there anyone that was sort of looking out for you in that regard? Um, I would say my parents, they tried their best to tell me what they experienced, what they went through, like back in the day, there wasn't like, they didn't really give them the choice. They mm. just put them there. They were telling me, just be careful, make sure you know what you're doing. Make sure you make your, you do your research so that you don't make the same mistakes that we were put into. Okay. Uh, Sydney, in 2020, the Ministry of Education announced that it would end the practice of academic streaming in grade nine, starting with math, um, recognizing that it was systemic, racist, and discriminatory. Now, looking back at it, now that's three years out, what impacts have we seen? Um, it's the idea that um, the black community has felt like a lot of the black students have been disproportionately streamed into applied and locally developed streams as a result of systemic factors. Um, these factors deprive students of their full opportunity. So when we are de-streaming, we're allowing students and their families more time to decide which pathway is best for them. Um, the level in which a student is streamed can open, close, or prolong the barriers or the opportunities that they have to go into post-secondary institutions. Would you like to see this initiative applied more broadly? I know it, it started with math and there were a number of other courses that would follow suit. Would you like to see it across the board? I definitely think it would be a great start. Um, we also have to remember too that there were classes that were already de-streamed when it comes to geography, uh, our religion and things like that, that have already been embedded within our systems that have been added more of an open level um, level. All right, Sydney, I want to I want to talk to you about uh, suspensions and expulsions. Uh, racialized students, particularly male, black and indigenous students, have a higher rate of suspensions and expulsions. Experts have analyzed that in, in many ways as a result of discrimination, reaction to trauma. Uh, what do you think is happening there? Um, 
I think that it basically it leads to harmful and poor outcomes, especially for Black and Indigenous students. Um, it adds to labeling stereotypes, and it also can limit a student's potential. Um, it can lead to overrepresentation of our Black youth in the criminal justice system, crim uh, increased dropouts, and failed course accumulation. And overall, it takes the students away from being in the classroom setting where they're meant to learn. Now, Noemi, I don't know if you knew this, but in 2020, the Ontario government eliminated discretionary suspensions for students from kindergarten up to grade three, recognizing that suspensions are often prejudice. And I'm, I'm curious, do you think that we should be considering that for older students as well? We definitely should, obviously, because it's still happening. Yes, there might be a rule, but there are a lot of people that are in a position of power who could easily ignore that and just go make a loophole and say, I didn't do it because of race. I did it because I saw this or I saw that or I heard this or heard that when in fact it might not be true. I think it's important that we do let it have we do like expand that because the older you get the more responsibility you have and if people are stopping you from going to school and getting the education you need it really just puts a damp and like it just it's a big ash it's a big challenge that you'd have to face on your own and if you don't have that kind of support and if you're always being pushed away from what you need to be and where you need to be it's just like it's not helpful at all all right, let's talk about some support. Sydney, when we talk about culturally responsive support, what does that actually mean? So it's the essence of having the ability to understand cultural intersectionality and the differences, the ability to recognize potential biases that can be embedded both overtly and covertly within institutions. When we're providing culturally relevant support, it empowers students on multiple levels intellectually, socially, emotionally, and politically. It enhances their overall understanding, knowledge, skills, and attitudes when it comes to institutions and how to you know, eliminate the stress that they might be feeling. Um, it, it's work that can be done by anyone that wants to work inside of educational systems. It's making the students feel like they're being represented. It's creating open door policies. It's creating courage and strength. And also it's being an active listener to what the students need. No, I mean, I'm curious, how has working with Sydney changed your goals for the future? Um, it helped me gain more knowledge on how important it is to support and how communication about things that feel important is like it's important. Because of Sydney, I now want to make sure that I'm able to put myself out there and participate. Now I'm more willing to speak up and try my best to help and support others. Um, with the help of Sydney, like I said, it's important to communicate about things that also feel wrong to you because if you never speak up you there will never be change so with the help of Sydney I've helped myself speak up and I've heard I'm more willing to hear other others and speak up for them because it does take a lot of strength and courage to even say things out loud because you never know what could happen if you end up saying the wrong sentence to the wrong people. Sydney it must be nice to hear uh, those kind <laughs> words uh, I'm just I'm curious you know how do you know how much impact you have on the students that you're working with? And, you know, it wasn't that long ago that, you, again, you were walking those halls. How important such a role is to have at schools like that as a graduation coach? I feel like definitely over time and hearing the students' uh, experiences in ways that I've, you know, just changed their lives in different ways. Uh, for me, it, it can be something small, but for them, it's something big. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, being that person for them and helping them navigate the educational system is amazing. You know, I couldn't do the work without without help and without support. And I'm I'm so happy that I'm working inside of an institution that wants to work on these changes that are you know happening across our system. And let's talk about solutions. Um, you know, high school is it can be four or five years, but it's just the start of the journey to whether it's post secondary or to the workforce. Sydney, how do we effectively in a appropriately address the lower rates of black students transitioning into post-secondary or the workforce? I think eliminating the barriers that I spoke about previously is definitely a start. Building social bonds and social capita so our students uh, can be connected to communities and networks beyond just themselves and their families by creating environments where they feel like they're being represented when it comes to culturally relevant pedagogies embedding that within our system, amplifying the students' voices, experiences, and truths, and inspiring them to be the change that they want to see. Noemi, I'm gonna I'm gonna read a quote that uh, that Sydney likes to say. 
in order to be it, you have to see it. How does that quote resonate with you? Well, um, I learned a few weeks, like last week, we talked about how most of the time you tend to act the way that people see you as. So if people say you're not smart or you're violent, you tend to act out on, on those emotions and those words, right? But I believe that being able to see people who look like you do things that seem too difficult or challenging makes it easier for someone to imagine themselves in that kind of position, which helps them bring in inspiration and motivation. Being me, being able to see what Sydney's doing makes me feel like I could do it too. Honestly, back in the day, I would have never been here where I am right now. I would have never spoke up, but hearing her talk about how important it is to help others make me feel like I should be doing the same thing as well. It made me feel more motivated, inspired by her to speak up, not be afraid to, to say what, how I feel and to talk to others and to never back down from a challenge. Amazing words. Sydney, uh, last question to you. Of course, this is, uh, you are in Windsor. Uh, there are a number of school boards that might be looking at ways to address sort of the systemic barriers um, that, are, that their students are facing. What is it that they need to pay attention to as, as a graduation coach or this program that uh, you think that they should uh, take part in? I think that the graduation coach program should be utilized across the system throughout all boards. Uh, the work that we're doing is very important, and I'm just one person that's within this uh, within this program. There are many graduation coaches who are doing amazing work. So I think that definitely every board should get on board with supporting this initiative. It's something that can, you know, address a lot of the barriers and gaps and to bring light um, for our students. Sydney, Noemi, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your experiences. Uh, all the best to you and to and all the tests that you have coming your way, Noemi. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. That is the agenda for Tuesday, February 21st, 2023. Fewer permanent residents are converting to Canadian citizens, according to new data from Statistics Canada. Tomorrow, we'll look into why and what it says about the experience of newcomers to this country. I'm Jane Jagannathan. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TDO's journalism. The agenda is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, tvo.org slash the agenda, or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch.